This is Free Radical Media. This is episode one of our weekly broadcast. I'm Patrick. I'm here with E and J. Um, today we're going to be talking about freedom, media, and radicalism. So what's up, guys? What's going on, man? Hi, Pat. Um, so what we're going to be talking about are our aims and goals in this project and uh, how they relate to those words in our name, freedom, radicalism, media. Uh, what are you guys' thoughts on uh, just generally? Well, as far as freedom and media go, I think they definitely intermingle. Um, you're only as free, really, as your media. Uh, you know, whoever controls the media is going to control the underlying ideologies of your society, the underlying philosophy, the underlying perceptions. So, depending on how free, just how free your media is and how free flowing it is. Uh, pretty much depends on how free thinking your pop populace is. I think you definitely hit on the core of it there, especially when we're talking about media in terms of ideologies, philosophies. Um, and these things really, when we're talking about the concept of freedom, are essentially constraining to us. Uh, to be tied into certain ideologies and philosophies is a restraint on what is uh, termed freedom, like the, the freedom of a human being to think uh, rationally and to act on their own uh, desires. Uh, no, it's that, that's exactly true. You know, when you look at the conditioning factors that are placed on people in society, you know, it starts from the moment you're born into, you know, your family, your, your religious background of your family, your community, the, the country in which you, you grow up in. So there's all these different factors that play onto the, the conditioning of the individual. And ultimately, inside of that conditioning, one has to wonder how free are you inside of your conditioning when you have all these different factors playing upon you. So really, this is about removing those factors, removing your past and looking at things objectively, open-mindedly, to to look at these concepts and to and to think of them in a way in which you may not have thought of them based on your previous conditioning of of your past in order to actually fulfill the promise of uh, of freedom itself the fact that we're inherently born entirely free to do whatever we please so these ideologies these constructs constrain us from fulfilling that goal and i think a lot of uh, maybe you guys agree or disagree that a lot of the goal uh, on us setting out in this project here is to show <clears throat> that we can interact with ideas without falling prey to ideology that we can interact with different ways of doing things different ways of thinking about things without being uh, locked into any set principle yeah absolutely it, I've always viewed ideology sort of like the software of the mind. You know, depending on what ideology you sort of live your life by, it's going to dictate pretty much everything. It's going to dictate how you uh, react to stim certain stimuli. It's going to dictate if there's meaning in the world. It's going to dictate, you know, a a pretty much everything. Um, and I think the ability to switch between uh, various ideologies is it's something that not everyone is able to do obviously I mean if you look at the world around us a lot of it is because of people uh, sort of dogmatizing their beliefs and I think it's a certain level of um, I think it takes a certain level of inquiry to sort uh, self inquiry uh, to be able to reach that level where you're able to you know switch between um, certain ideologies a lot of which may may very well contradict each other that's an interesting thought. If someone is not capable or unwilling or they simply don't think or haven't been um, exposed to different ideas, uh, if they're not pro capable of that process of self-reflection to critically examine their own actions and ideas, are they truly free or are they just a victim or a product of their conditioning? That is, to, to what extent do most people experience freedom? 
I, I think that's a good point. You know, when, when you think about the aspects that are played on top of people, more more likely they are coming with those preconditioned notions based on their past. So, you know, when they're when they're looking at a subject and they're discussing a subject, they're discussing that subject from their past experience and you know to to self-reflect is is to realize what is playing on you as a person and and what your conditions are what your prerequisites of of understanding are and if you if you allow these things to determine the way you come at a subject you're not coming at it open-mindedly you're coming at it through these ideas that have already been placed upon you so to become open-minded is to become aware of the conditioning that's placed upon you however subtle it is and to remove yourself from that and to look at it as open-mindedly as possible because each person is coming with a different background and a different set of ideology and if if you're incapable of removing yourself from these things then you're just constantly arguing your background versus another person's background and you're missing the greater point of the philosophical subject that's being discussed inside of that conversation the the greeks are really good at that <laughs> yeah yeah um i had a uh, i had an english professor once tell me that the difference that argument was originally a form of inquiry it wasn't about your idea beating out another's idea it was about using using debate as a way to inquire deeper into your idea and possibly disregarding it altogether if you found that it just wasn't valid depending on the other person's evidence that they brought up in the debate socrates essentially you know absolutely. that kind of tradition <clears throat> absolutely and i th i sort of feel that pure form of debate we've really lost that in our culture. No, right? absolutely. Oh, definitely. And, I, and I think that's really at the crux of a lot of our uh, a lot of our problems, especially in the mainstream media. You know, you look it almost becomes a shouting match where people are just talking over each other and they're continuously trying to drown out another person if they're disagreeing with the viewpoint that they're bringing forward, especially when it, you know you look at the host of a show and they try and dictate and talk over people and intimidate people. And, and how can you possibly call that an open an open thought and an open conversation when you know you're you're still adhering to your biased opinion and you're not allowing the person who may contradict your opinion or disagree with your opinion to to state their opinion so then you can both have an open conversation about why is it that you feel this way and why is it this person feels that way and let's figure out what ideology you know, to have a conversation about those two ideologies openly inside of the inside of the construct of the topic itself. Basically, instead of having an open conversation, you have representatives of two firm, unyielding ideologies butting heads with each other. Exactly. So what you have there is is essentially the past. Okay, uh, the past constructs of ideology constraining us from moving forward. And I think that's true in a macro sense in the media with ideology and history itself. And in a micro sense where we personally as people cannot divorce ourselves from our past in order to change ourselves or to do something new. So I, th I think it's, it's a problem that stretches from us individually as I think all things are derived from the human being individually um, and, and into our culture, into our society. You know, so it, it, history itself is an example of this. I mean, the the past certainly holds us hostage in some ways. No, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, even the main the mainstream media, uh, like you just said, it gives you option A and option B, and presents it in such a way that those two op that those two ideas are totally incompatible with each other. But what they don't let you know is. That there very well may there very well uh, may be a a meta option, something that encompasses both, that sort of transcends both, that makes both uh, not irrelevant, but incorporates both to a, to a sort of higher understanding of things, and that's sort of limiting people's perceptions just to right or left or you know what whatever you want to call it is 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 a really good way of narrowing their perception down. Uh, and not letting them really see uh, 
see outside of the box that they're sort of trapped in. Certainly in the West, we have this idea, concept of duality that, uh, look at the United States, look at our politics, for example. We're presented politically with, you know, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party as being, you know, the narrative is that they're completely incompatible and they represent two distinct philosophies, right? Well, that's fundamentally untrue. Those two parties both represent neoliberal capitalist interests, okay? So, in a large sense, foreign policy is going to be the same between the two parties, and the great majority of domestic policy is going to be the same between those two parties, because they represent, first of all, a similar ideology, and secondly, the same, uh, you know, lobbying groups and influence groups. Right? So you're not going to see a real difference, but we're presented with this A, B, du- dualistic option, right? And whatever side you pick, you're going to think the other side is, you know, the bad, the other, and think your side are your, you know, comrades, your, your countrymen, you know. So you have this, this dualistic Western ideal, but if you look at it a little deeper, that's really just not the case. Oh, well, really, to the point where you just said, you know, you think it, it ultimately it these two groups are arguing over semantics because there is so much commonality between these two groups. You know, they argue over abortion issues and gay rights issues and and things that at their core should not be issues inside of society, yet because there needs to be this divide in this Western world, we then just take these subjects and divide them between the two parties and then they just argue over these things instead of arguing over more profound philosophical issues that are facing the society and instead of moving forward and in, in growing intellectually we keep staying in the past and fighting over these things that really should have already been taken care of and and removed at this point absolutely yeah. it's certainly I think uh, I think that the the mainstream media you know media in general reinforces this narrative, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, that I've heard it argued before, and I really don't disagree with it, the idea that media in, its, in and of itself, whatever media source, is going to be inherently... is going to be inherently biased, no matter what, no matter what it is. It's either a left or a right. It's going to be inherently biased. I agree with that, and, and I don't think that's always necessarily a bad thing. Like, Absolutely you know, Howard not. Zinn talks about it a lot, you no. know, that you can't escape bias, so you should just kind of uh, acknowledge it, and then try to, pro- you know, project the best, most rational narrative you can, you know. It's and that's just it, acknowledging it, not denying it. Because all these news stations, uh, you know, they, they'll never admit that they're being biased. But it's like, well, why not? It's a free country. You're allowed to have your free ideas. Mm-hmm. But again, it's trying, to, it's trying to keep the ideological dialogue on that mainstream level. Whereas if someone really did come out with a, a, a strongly biased uh, idea... It, it it wouldn't it wouldn't pl- it wouldn't play down to the general populace, mm-hmm. you know. So I think it's it's I mean for me personally, I'd much rather have a biased uh, news source, but at least it be honest and true to itself and acknowledge what it what it exactly was instead of uh, playing into these uh, you know uh, endlessly playing into these ideals of you know uh, right versus left and and so on and so forth. So I think I think um, right now would be a perfect transition into the term radical and radicalism. You know, we're talking about these subjects um, of of mainstream media. We're labeling these things like that. Now, in in the mainstream, the term radical is a demonizing term, especially here in the Western world. We Absolutely. we anyone who disagrees with the societal norm is then labeled as a radical and oftentimes this isn't the case it's just an alternative way of thinking and the vast majority of people who have an alternative way of thinking are not people who are trying to incite violence or disruption in society they're just merely trying to bring a more intellectual point to the conversation instead of having these these ideologies these these societal norms 
be what is driving society and to, and to think openly about the subject, but for some reason inside of normal culture and normal media, these ideas are dismissed as being radical ideas. Sure. And, and th- let's think about let's think about the word radical for a second. Uh, radical has connotations like for example, um, when we're talking about root systems, we talk about radical, right? When we talk about radius, we talk about radical. Well, these things are core systems. So so radicalism is talking about fundamental core ideas. okay? So we're talking about um, essentially, just getting to the bottom of things. For example, you can call uh, someone who is an extremist in a particular ideology a radical because they go down to the the very core uh, fundamental ideas of that particular ideology. So it doesn't have these dirty connotations, okay, that we hear about in the media because it's dismissive. Okay, so so, uh, someone disagrees with you or they have very out-of-the-box ideas. Well, you call them a radical to dismiss them, and that, by extension, dismisses their ideas. Okay, so that it's limiting. That label is limiting, and radicalism itself, it, you know, it isn't about extremism. It's about a radical, if you will, shift away from systems that aren't working. Okay, at least in my mind, you know, uh, I, I accept the term radical, but. I don't see it in the same manner that someone who's just experiencing mainstream media or experiencing the the mainstream narrative of society might. Um, you know, radicalism is 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 something that's just about fundamentals and core ideas. And and you, like we were saying earlier, you know, uh, we're 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 dictated by our past conditioning and our our past upbringing and the ideas that we were brought up with. And to truly be able to come up with new ideas, sometimes it takes a shift to the fringe. It takes a shift to the periphery. It takes a shift outside of the norm. You know, you, to, in order to find to fully articulate yourself with new ideas that aren't being talked about, you got to leave the. You got to sort of stop drinking out of the mainstream. Sure, sure, absolutely. You know, it's. Uh and especially if you're, if we go back to the topic of freedom for a second and what radicalism, how it interacts with the concept of freedom. Truly, if, if you don't ever step outside of the box of your ideology and think outside of cultural norms, then you are in a very real sense limited in your freedom because you never challenge those ideas yeah. from your past or your culture or your upbringing. And so you're not leading life... In a, in a manner that's authentic to you, you know. What's more important is what are your values, mm. right? What are what are your ideas? And radicalism, and, and certainly I think our society should allow a place for you to express your own ideas outside of cultural norms. Explore them. Right. right. And that's that's actually really interesting. You know, when you think of the individual, uh, you know, to. For the individual to be free inside of a societal normality is radical to society itself Absolutely. because it's an individual being free, it's an vi- individual being open-minded, it's an individual looking at society not through the lens of society but through the lens of their own perception of society and in that sense it is a radical concept but is that a bad concept? No, because every single person should at some point in their life look th- look at reality through their own eyes and not through the eyes in which they're being told to look at it from. And I think too many people, they, they accept the societal idea of reality and they don't think openly and they don't look openly at the subject. And is that truly freedom? Is that, is that a true freedom? Of thought and of experience. Absolutely, and, and, and you can think about it in terms of, you know, again, duality. Uh, you know, you might listen to this and, and think, um, well, here's an argument for individualism, or here's an argument for collectivism. You might 
listen to anything and, and, and think of those things. But in reality, the human experience is more complex than should we focus on the individual and their freedom, or should we focus on the collective community and how we can um, uh, sustain ourselves as individuals within a community, right? Mm -hmm. So it's it's not about the duality. The answer is we can do both. We can express freedom on an individual level and freedom as a society as a whole simultaneously if we free ourselves of the constraints of uh, modern or even past ideologies and, and philosophies. Right. It's almost as if, in, in some ways, the idea of the collective democracy in a way sort of becomes a form of bondage because then it's like you have to adhere to this consensus instead of following your own individual values and really the the only the 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 true form of that the pure form of that would be what what you guys just said fully following your own values without having to adhere to the to the consensus decision because, you know, I've heard that as an argument against, quote unquote, democracy, that well, what is democracy other than just majority rule, you know? Um, right. And like, you know, people like the founding fathers, let's go back to that, uh, the founding fathers of the United States. Um, you know, they saw the problem of majority rule uh, in Athenian democracy, for example, and they chose to structure the United States along the lines of uh, the Roman Republic because it provided more, um, shall we say, safeguards against the majority and the tyranny of the majority is the term. So, uh, but, but where, where does that leave us, right? And where does that leave democracy itself? Do we, do, are, do we even really know what democracy in modern times means, really? Um, is that the way for people to freely e express the ramifications of their freedom? Well, I, I don't think it always is. Mm. No, I think I think that you know inside of we call ourselves a democracy, but we're not at all. We're represent or representative democracy, and that that's not necessarily meaning that each individual's ideas are being represented. Mm. You know, it, the, the representatives of a community are the representatives of a collective community, and they are representing the majority of the idea. And a lot of times, they're not. A lot of times, they're representing their own biased opinions, and they're coming to the table not, not from what their community necessarily needs, but what their party mm -hmm. is projecting. And a lot of times, the... The core issues are being are being removed from the conversation, and instead of talking about moving forward, it's it's the stagnant inside of inside of the politics of of this left and right issue. Yeah, no doubt, and, and that sort of goes back to this whole this whole project we're doing. You know, you're only really as free as the media and if you have a couple institutions running your media and, and, and peddling cer only certain ideas or certain sphere of ideas then any ideas that are on the periphery of that or people that adhere to ideas on the periphery of that aren't being aren't being spoken for you know and it, it's a huge problem uh, more and more and I, I think we're, we're making progress with things like the internet where people like us that do have ideas that aren't obviously represented by the mainstream are able to speak up and there's a lot and, and ironically enough there's a lot more of us than we ever thought there's a lot of us out there but we don't meet we don't meet the needs of these institutions we are a lot of our values clash with these institutions and that's where freedom and media um, re really start to uh, influence each other profoundly. And that's really where we get labeled as the radicals by the, the perceived normal society. And I think that is one of the biggest obstacles that a project like this has because 
the those who adhere to the mainstream ideas are going to then say, oh, well, this is a radical, this is, this is nonsense. And the problem with thinking like that is you're not openly allowing yourself to think about the subject. You're coming to it with your preconditioned ideas. And none of what we are trying to do with this project has anything to do with any sort of specific ideology. We are opening up the forum for every single person who has an open-minded train of thought. But if you're coming to the conversation in a conditioned way in which you are incapable of listening to an alternative way of thinking, an alternative ideology, and if you're only going to simply sit there and say, you are wrong, I am right, and I do not believe anything other than that, then you're missing the greater point of what it is we're trying to do. We're trying to open up thought. We're trying to open up intellectualism and philosophy, things that are being lost inside of this society because of the portrayed normalcy and simplicity of this society. And I, I, I totally agree. And, and, and I think a lot of it has to do with... If you have these preconceived notions, right, and you see... Uh, new ideas as being radical or something that is against your own ideology or your own, you know, bias, you're reacting to that, okay? So when you get angry and argue about it, you, you are simply reacting to that stimuli, okay? That, in, to my mind, is not a true expression of freedom. Well, why? Because you are not engaging with that idea and saying, well, this is the reason that I disagree by your own value system. You're relying on past experience and you're relying on past ideology and your own position within society. Okay, your, your, your essence rather than your existence. Um, the essence of what society says you are rather than as just a free individual who's coming to the table saying this is, this is why I disagree personally. Right, so that's not a true expression of freedom, and therefore I don't think that it's really it's valid in that sense. If you're not going to be open-minded to engage with that idea, turn it over in your head, explore it, and then come back with a uh, a response, mm. if you see what I mean. And I think that fundamentally goes into what what it, what is the essence of of the concept of freedom, it, which I think is something we're going to be exploring quite a lot within the confines of our project here is I think something that we're all really concerned with is is what is freedom mm. I mean do you guys want to explore that idea in, a, in an abstract sense for well a few I mean first and foremost I mean it would be to think freely but that's a lot more difficult you know than it seems you know at least for a majority of people and you know you, you, you you watch TV all day, you listen to the radio, it's like, well, how many of your ideas are truly your own? And it takes, again, it takes a lot of self-awareness, primarily, to fully articulate and fully find your true values that you have as an individual. And I do believe individuals have their own independent uh, value system. I do believe that, or at least we could, if we don't have them inherently, then we can create them on our own through, you know, whatever means, rational inquiry or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like in native cultures, they had the whole idea of the vision quest. And it was before you reached adulthood, they sent you out into the wilderness, usually alone. And through that experience, you became individuated you fully entered adulthood. You left the, the, the realm of, of the child and entered into it as an adult. And we really don't have the experience of totally entering into a period of, of, of isolation or of detaching ourselves from this matrix of ideas that we get through the mainstream and fully having the, just the time and, and uh, you know, just the time and, and, and ability to articulate our own set of beliefs. And I think it's profoundly important. I honestly think that that is of vital importance as well, that, that idea of that rite of passage, because to those cultures, 
uh, those cultures which were, you know, uh, obviously more close chronologically to our period as, as, you know, simple animals than rather being quote-unquote civilized. That rite of passage was important because it says that before you can become a member of the community, a functioning, vital member of the community, you have to realize the implications of your own freedom as an individual. Mm. That you have to go into the wilderness, explore those ideas, right? Explore your own mind mm. before you can come back to the community and say, I am ready to become a, a vibrant part of this this society, right? So before anything else, you have to realize the implications of your own absolute freedom and individuality. Mm. I think so much inside of this society, like we were saying, you know, it it doesn't allow for that. It doesn't allow for the person to truly explore themselves as an individual. And I was thinking earlier when when you were talking, Pat, about how uh, you know the this idea in which we don't we don't have a way to to think freely about things it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier with this idea of being conditioned by your by your family you know your culture your religion things of this nature um Jadu Krishnamurti he had a really good quote where he said when when a child sees a bird and you say, you say to that child, oh, that bird is a sparrow. The child ceases to see that bird for what it was ever again. Mm -hmm. It's now associating that bird as being a sparrow. Absolutely. And I think that that is a perfect example of the conditioning placed upon all of us from childhood by others saying that this is this, this is that, this is why this is the way it is, this is why that's the way it is. And then it removes a truly free way of thinking about whatever it is that you're seeing, about whatever it is that you're thinking about, and and it's then being done so through a, through an ideology that's been placed inside of the person instead of their own free thought about what it is that they're looking at or what it is that they're thinking about. Yeah, definitely, I 100% agree, and it's it's uh, unfortunately it's it's not easy to do. I mean, we're we're all we're we're all responsible. We've all done it. We do it all the time. You know, it's a catch-22. It's like we have this awesome thing called language, and we're able to look at something and label it, and that's such a great thing for creating culture. But at the very same time, it sort of imprisons us because it makes us chronically conceptualize everything. Yeah, absolutely. The language definitely constitutes, again, uh, uh, a limitation on freedom, a, a limitation on how our ideas can process an idea, uh, you know, the idea of language is so that we can communicate effectively with one another, but sometimes it gets in the way of effectively communicating yeah. with one another. And sometimes when you get into semantics, especially when language takes on different meanings for different people, um, that just furthers that limitation. Um, for example, professional jargon even is a, a means by which some people are isolated from taking part in certain conversations. A, a group of doctors, for example, sitting around a table talking about their profession are going to be using their professional jargon. Now, the waiter or waitress who comes up to the table is not going to be able to effectively take part in that conversation or understand that conversation because they're using a specialized subset of language. Right. Okay, so that's a, a, a limitation there when really any human being has the capability to become a doctor and practice medicine. Okay, um, if certain you know preconceived notions are uh, are met, but that level, that gateway, shall we say, of elitism and professionalism, right? That construct limits the ability for certain people to understand certain things and that's a function of language mm. that's actually you know that's one of the interesting things about language is that in language in and of itself you know it can be a barrier to freedom because when you have these these conflicting things where one person is unable to understand another person when they're talking well how can you have a free flow of conversation if you're not understanding what it is that that person is saying and they then may not be understanding what you're saying mm. you know so 
language in and of itself is is a conditioning factor and and it and it makes one question how free are we inside of language mm -hmm. i mean we can express ourselves however we want but we're expressing ourselves through our own interpretation of language and another person's interpretation of that language may not be the same as yours so then that in and of itself can have a conflicting ideology in the way the two people are trying to communicate with each other. Right. And I don't know necessarily if it has to be conflicting. You know, I mean, the three of us, for example, we're, we're all different. We all have somewhat different views, but we, we all are able to put our ideas on the table, put, put the way we uh, understand those ideas and sort of find the common ground. You know, going back to what we were saying earlier, it's not always in the mainstream media it's always portrayed as some sort of conflict but it doesn't have to be that way and I think it's important I think it's profoundly important to really to really understand when when you know when you look up at the stars what do you see what do you think how do you describe it and then turn to someone else and see what they see and how they describe it and, and find the common ground and maybe they see more maybe they've studied it more maybe they instead of looking at the stars they're looking at the stars through a telescope and they could see a heck of a lot more and their linguistic map might be have a little bit more detail but I don't I don't think you know we're so conditioned to immediately be like no 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 that that you know just because you're different then somehow I have to be, I have to argue my point. And it's just, that's just such a flawed way of thinking in and of itself. And, uh, and I think con continuously striving to first and foremost, identifying what you honestly perceive and then comparing notes with, with everyone else. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a function of, you know, what we would call consensus reality. You know, the world that, all of us see isn't the same as the world we collectively see you know as as individuals we see things like you were talking about your analogy uh, gazing up at the stars you know ancient peoples gazed up at the stars and and picked out constellations and patterns because our minds are are constructed to build patterns by the things we right. experience and see and halfway around the globe another set of people were looking at the same stars and picking out new constellations right and sharing them with their group. So the reality that we experience isn't necessarily, and cer actually, it's certainly not the same reality that the person sitting next to you is experiencing. Mm -hmm. And realizing that, I think, is of vital importance to realize that consensus reality isn't necessarily real, right? It's not real for you. What's real for one person is not the same as reality for another person. Right. But through communication and experience, we can build something, right? And that's all we do as humans is collaborate. construct these things, collaborate, right. you know, which means if we have the freedom to do that, we have the freedom to construct anything we want. If these are just things we build in our heads as, in consensus uh, as a people or as groups, we have the freedom to build anything we please. It's like, so culture, in other words, just turns into a collective collaborative art project in a sense yeah I, I think that's a excellent metaphor I would agree with that yeah, yeah I think um, each one of us is adding our own interpretation to reality and it just layers upon each other and it creates that collective viewpoint of reality because each individual person's perspective brings another thing to the table that we collectively organize as this mass collection of of reality and of interpretation of reality and you know each one of us is you know each one of us will have our own opinions on it but it is taking in each person's opinion and and listening to it openly mm -hmm. and interpreting it in in allowing and not allowing your own biased opinion to remove that other person's idea to listen to it openly and for them to listen to you openly and then collectively we create a reality based on all of our open-mindedness towards each other and how we can all together move forward inside of this collective reality as individuals with individual ideas on the reality itself hmm. and I think as an example 
of all this, uh, this project that the three of us are working on is a collaborative project, right? And um, if we're talking about language, we've chosen a name. We've chosen this free radical media. Obviously, we all have ideas about what that means as being a string of words, all the words independent of one another, mm. okay? Um, and we're all collaborating to make it one unique thing, one, uh, one unique item or one unique idea, right, that'll go out there. And certainly uh, others who, who are listening or others who will participate have their own ideas of what that means, mm. right? And I think the biggest expression of what we're trying to do is that that's okay. It's okay for everyone to have their own ideas of what this means because that contributes to the entirety of the project as a whole. And that's a microcosm of what society can be. We can all collectively uh, contribute and build something. And it's ironic, too, because uh, me and Jay were talking last night and even a free radical... And it's like, what is a free radical? And it's like, an, it's like basically a renegade electron, an electron that isn't fitting to the rest of the of the atom. Right. And it, it kind of fits into how you know what we're doing in the sense of media. It's like we're we're uh, quote unquote radical ideas that aren't fitting into the mainstream, that are trying to escape the inertia of of the consensus. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, you, you know, it, when you look at quantum mechanics, for example, you, you, you find these, these weird little particles that pop in and out of existence, it seems like. They could be in two places at once, right? And what is there more, a true expression of freedom than that? That these little bits of matter can be in multiple places if they choose to be. They can be <laughs> in existence or out of existence if they choose to be. You know, so you get down into that quantum level there. I mean, I think it's a pretty good allegory right. of those concepts. Right. You know, uh, I think it's an interesting thing. I think it also then it 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 really goes to to describe what do we define as reality in and of itself. When you have these concepts, and especially with quantum physics, you know it's that that field is so incredible, and on what it's it's showing, and what we're starting to learn from it, and, and it really, I, I think that it it forces a person to then look at reality in a different way in which they had previously, because we realize that we know. Essentially, none of us know anything about reality. And if we are limiting ourselves to what we think we know, then we'll never be able to venture out and learn other things. We're going to be continuing to come through it from our ideas, from our backgrounds, and not move forward to explore reality further and to see where we can take this as a collective group of individuals. Absolutely. There's there's so much profound wisdom in admitting or humbling yourself to admit that you simply just don't know that much in the grand scheme of things. And it's it, in my in my experience, it hasn't been disempowering in the least because as soon as whenever I've had an experience where I'm truly in awe of the immense complexity of the universe, all of a sudden I realize that all these beliefs that I that I had taken as as fact are really nothing more than just a, a figment of my imagination and then it opens up this grand new world where I could explore and come up with new ideas and new paradigms and totally empowers me I, I, I agree with that I, I think it's fundamentally incredibly empowering the, like just the experience uh, well, honestly, of realizing that you really don't know anything. Of actually having that moment where you say, well, all the things I've learned, I really haven't even scratched the surface. I, I feel like that opens up tremendous doors. It, it, it allows you to say, well, I can make any decision I wish to. I can learn whatever I wish to. I can create whatever I wish to, mm. right? It's incredibly empowering, that idea. It has profound implications for us as individuals and as a species, I think. 
It reminds me of, um, you know, of course, Socrates. I know that I don't know. But also in Zen, you know, they have the concept of beginner's mind. Mm -hmm. And and getting yourself to that position is, it's, it's, you know, it's counterintuitive. It would it would seem as if you're going backwards, but in a lot of ways, it's it's the complete opposite. It's breaking down old old barriers to establish new ones. No, certainly, certainly, and I think that's fundamental. You know, to to break down, uh, break down the past, really, to, to take the good things and reinforce them and uh, carry them to their fullest potential discard things that didn't work right you know that that kind of uh, that kind of picking and choosing that kind of free expression that that kind of taking the past into account when you make decisions but to not let it force you into a, a decision mm. I think I think too I think that's one of the biggest things that we as a collective society need to, to realize is that when something isn't working for the collective good of a society, we need to stop doing it. We need to stop. We need to just admit to ourselves that we have been wrong. That the way we are doing something is wrong, and there's no, there is nothing wrong with that. There is nothing wrong with as a society collectively agreeing that something that we were doing is wrong, and there are many things that we are doing wrong in society, but we will not change that until collectively we say we were wrong and and I think as we were as we've been talking about it's so hard for a person to admit that they know nothing and it's even more hard for them to admit that they were wrong about something and and to do these things are a positive they there are individual building experience and they're a collective building experience because we remove ourselves from the things we're doing wrong and then we say okay what can we now do to right these wrongs to hopefully do things better and to hopefully in the way that we change these things make everything better for all of us and and that is really the thing that we need as a society to start looking at and doing mm, absolutely it, it it goes back to the idea that you know look failure is okay failure is all right now you you, you should sit back, analyze your failure, and learn from your failure. But as individuals and as societies, we have failed in the past. All of us have. And that's all right. That that in and of itself is liberating to know that you can attempt something and fail and pick yourself back up and do it again properly. Hmm. Right? Failure is is just a stepping stone to, to your eventual success. You know, I mean... It's okay to fail, and we need to create spaces in which it's acceptable to fail as people or as societies. As long as we learn from those mistakes and move forward rather than dwelling on past failures or past successes for that matter. Mm, absolutely. And I think I think this this sums up what it is we are trying to do. We are trying to openly talk about all these different subjects we're trying to openly create a dialogue between people and and to admit that we're wrong about many things in in all of us all, all, all three of us you know there there are going to be things that that we may talk about that in the future will end up turning out to be wrong that will end up turning out to be not a good way to go about doing things but that's okay because this this forum is about simply coming to the discussion open-mindedly free of any preconditioning and to collectively come to ways to better society and to further ourselves into the future instead of continuing the the things that we've done in our past that have led us to many instances in our present where there are things that could potentially do harm to us as a collective society if we don't start to address these issues and and try and change things and move forward from these things mm, absolutely and you know I, with this project especially it's 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 doing philosophy recklessly and by recklessly I mean that we're not we're, we're leaving room for creativity we're leaving room for us to to like you said say something that wasn't 100% factually true or whatever but 
learning from those mistakes and doing it in a way where we can go forward from it instead of trying to be afraid to leave those to leave the safe territory and to venture out to the new more radical ideas uh, where, where we're truly going to uh, further the dialogue uh, for not just ourselves but society as a whole and really uh, come up with new ways of thinking on an individual level. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think um, <clears throat> I, I think the key, the core of what we're doing here is to open those doors, to engage with ideas freely, right? And we're not afraid to be wrong. We're not afraid for other people to prove us wrong. We're not afraid to admit that we're wrong. We will never be afraid to admit that we're wrong. Or uh, that <laughs> uh, wrongness itself might be a means to an end. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be afraid to engage with radical ideas. Really, I think what we're doing <clears throat> is we're creating a safe space for dangerous ideas. Mm -hmm. We want to enter in uncharted waters. We want to uh, go into uh, uncharted territory, and we want to go off the map. And I think that's really what we're trying to do here. Absolutely. And really, I think you know all we ask of those of you who are listening to what we're doing, those of you who may comment on what we're doing, all we are asking of you is to do the same thing, to come at it openly, to come at it knowing that you don't know everything, and none of us know everything. And that you may be wrong, and there's going to be plenty of times that all of us are wrong. That every single person in society is going to be more oftentimes wrong than right. And if we all collectively come to this openly, and we all have open dialogue on these subjects, whether they be a radical subject or not, whatever it is that we're discussing, if we openly look at these subjects then we may collectively be able to find solutions to the many problems that are facing the society and hopefully the goal of this is to move society forward and to move forward in in various ways that are good for society and are not sustaining these issues that have caused us to reach the point that we're at in society mm. Enhancing the dialogue and bringing the dialogue to the to the fringe, and uh, is it, it, definitely I think a noble purpose for this project, um, and uh, hopefully I think it's something that more and more people are jumping in on because there are, uh, believe it or not, a lot of people that do share our beliefs, no matter how radical they are. Uh, because they do recognize that reality is inherently there is an inherently subjective aspect to reality as there is an inherently objective aspect to reality you know it's it's not they're, they're not two separate things in fact they are one and the same they they do share the same space to each other and i think the objective i mean i know in my personal spiritual pursuits Finding the intermingling between the subjective and the objective, um, if you want to use esoteric terms, between the masculine, uh, the subjective, and the feminine, the objective, or the yin and the yang, is the ultimate form of, of spiritual alchemy. You know, And I think this vehicle that we have, free radical media, is, is uh, the perfect way to uh, pursue that. I agree completely, and, and I think as we move forward with this, we are going to enter various subject matters that will hopefully change the viewpoints of society and, and move us all forward in a positive manner. This is all about a positive moving forward collectively as a people into the future that who knows what it has to hold. Most certainly, most certainly. And, you know, I think you see a lot more when you're on the edge of the wheel, right? When you're in the center, you only see out a certain point. But when you're on the very edge of it, you see outside of the wheel itself. And I think mm. that is kind of what we're looking at. We're looking at things that are outside of the structures we're familiar with, that we're comfortable with. And when we begin to do that, we begin to step outside our comfort zones, if you will, that's when we really get down into the meat of existence and the human experience. 
Yeah, uh, revolution start on the fringe, no doubt about it. You know, and enhancing the uh, enhancing the dialogue and enhancing the the map and be making it a little bit more, just adding a little bit more to its accuracy to the actual territory is uh, definitely what, what this is all about, you know. And will we ever, Will is it even possible to ever create a map that is identical to the territory? Most likely not, because whenever it seems that we figure out or have an idea of what the territory is to build a map on, it seems that the territory itself changes. So, and I guess that's the, the whole miraculous, fun nature of it. Absolutely, sure. Absolutely. I think this has been a really uh, a great initial discussion that we've had here. Um, obviously, in the future, um, we're going to be talking about a lot, of, uh, a lot of things, a lot of issues, and, and definitely our opinions aren't the only ones out there. So what we're definitely going to be doing is placing... Um, uh, the sources uh, that, that we get our ideas from or things that we're interested in or engaged with, we're going to be posting a lot of links um, along with these episodes. Um, we're going to be posting a lot of source material with these episodes so that you can further uh, your own investigations into these issues because obviously this is just a starting point. Everything is just a starting point. You can always go deeper into the well. So we want to uh, make sure everybody has the opportunity to investigate things to their fullest extent and hopefully beyond what we've investigated it. And one, one thing I'd like to just stress one more time to everyone is that we are not coming to these issues and talking about these issues and saying that our opinions are... Are, are valid in these issues. These, these, are merely, these are merely just our interpretations of the things we're talking about. So we're not, we're not proclaiming to know anything. We're just merely opening up the dialogue to have conversations about these subjects because every person's idea is valid. So we all need to collectively have a conversation about these issues. Absolutely. And, uh, well, it's about sums it up. I think I so. I think so. Look for more content from us in the future and uh, enjoy. Find us on uh, Facebook, Free Radical Media, um, and we'll keep you guys updated uh, when our website is, when we got a web address figured out and our website's up. And uh, keep in touch. There's more to come. Our Facebook and Twitter is slash Free Rad Media on both of them. So check it out.